Plastic surgeons from the clinic may sometimes feel that their colleagues from the animal or cadaver labs speak a different language. While the specifics of experimental articles in PRS may be outside the comfort zone of some of the readers, including myself, the subject matter should be of great and vital interest to all. The discoveries in our plastic surgery laboratories often lead to big news and important changes in clinical medicine. Today we're taking a visit in plastic surgery's global laboratories to focus on the experimental side of plastic and reconstructive surgery. Joining me today is Associate Editor and Experimental Expert, Dr. Paul Saderna from the University of Michigan. Thanks for joining us, Paul. Thank you, Rod. It's my pleasure to be here today to provide you with some insights into three experimental articles published in Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. Great. Let's get started with the first article, a rabbit study out of China that takes a closer look at flap prefabrication which bridges the gap between reconstructive procedures and tissue engineering. These authors aim to determine the feasibility of prefabricating large skin flaps based upon the intrinsic venous system alone. How did they set up their experiment, Paul, and what do you think about their results? In this model, they've taken the femoral artery on a single side and anastomosed it to the thoracolipogastric vein on that same side. They then make it cut proximally on the abdomen and distally on the abdomen to delay the flap. After seven days, they then lift the entire flap up and evaluate flap viability. The flap viability of the arterialized venous prefabricated flap was 100%. The viability of the normal arterialized flap was 100%. And the viability of an arterialized venous flap without prefabrication was substantially less. Of course, this tells us that with a simple seven-day prefabrication, utilizing an arterialized venous approach, we're able to not only capture one angiosome, the angiosome in the region of the single anastomosis, but also an adjacent angiosome, which is the contralateral side of the abdomen. And how can these results make the quantum leap from the laboratory to clinical medicine? Rarely when we consider experimental studies can we see an immediate line to clinical applicability. In this case, performing an arterialized venous anastomosis along with the delay procedure is something we could easily do this afternoon in our operating rooms. With this kind of knowledge in hand, we have the opportunity to leverage this technology to create very large arterialized venous free flaps for free tissue transport or even possibly as pedicle flaps to provide reconstructive options for difficult wounds. Now let's look at another article, an investigation on wound healing. By specifically monitoring the healing of defects on rabbit's ears, the authors aim to determine if systematic use of enzymatic inhibitors could affect the formation of hypertrophic scars. What did they discover? And what do these discoveries mean to all of us in the day-to-day -day practice of plastic surgery? In this study, what they did is they took rabbit ear models and did small punch biopsies on the back of the ears. They had four groups. One group received oral enalapril immediately following the punch biopsy. One group received oral enalapril 28 days following the punch biopsy. One group received the standard intralesional steroid injections at day 28 and 35, and then there was a control group. After 40 days, they then evaluated the quality of these wounds. And what they found is that the early enalapril treated group had smaller scars, and they had decreased fibroblast production. This is an incredibly exciting result. Interestingly, the late group did not have any change in their scars, but that late enalapril group did have decreased fibroblasts present. So it does appear that early enalapril does actually reduce hypertrophic scar formation, probably through a mechanism involving decreased collagen production. Our last experimental study is out of Stanford, California, and it analyzes lymphedema at a molecular level. These incredible authors have harvested and studied adipose-derived stem cells to determine what, if any, differences exist between healthy and post-cancer lymphedema patients, adipose-derived stem cells. So what difference 
did they find? And what does it mean to all of us that are treating these very challenging lymphedema patients? What they found in patients with lymphedema is that the adipose-derived stem cells in that group had a significantly increased adipogenic potential and differentiation. With that, they did not see a corresponding increase in vasculogenic potential and in fact saw a decrease in vasculogenic potential in the ASCs from lymphedema patients as compared to unaffected patients. And in the osteogenic realm, there really were no differences between any of the groups. So this tells us that the underlying pathophysiology of lymphedema is driving adipose-derived stem cells towards adipogenic differentiation. These findings are very exciting and important in that they tell us that stem cells, and in particular the adipose-derived stem cells, are playing some sort of role in lymphedema. To date, this doesn't really help us with any intervention to reduce the incidence of lymphedema. Thank you, Paul. From lymphedema to wound healing to prefabricated flaps, some of the most exciting frontiers in our field began in the research laboratories across the world in plastic surgery. These experimental studies in PRS and in our companion journal, PRS Go, pose questions from all plastic surgeons globally, and we should all be interested in helping to understand and answer these questions. So join the conversation by reading and studying Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery this month.